Myself, I'm Johnny Primo. I'm coordinator of the Seeds Project, which is a European Commission funded uh, project of funded by the Future and Emerging Technologies group of the European Commission and the Framework 7. There are 16 partners, it's a 7 million uh, euro funding project, of uh, 6.5 million euro funding project, um, over four years, where there's a focus on how we can use human senses to understand patterns in big data that current tools don't enable, and what the applications of that may be, and what the technology can do to support um, discovery and understanding in big data. Um, I'm also a senior lecturer in psychology at Goldsmiths, at the University of London, that's the Ben Atten, which I coordinate the CDC project. And I also run IT Media Research Limited, which is a spin-off company from Goldsmiths, uh, which I founded in 2002, so we're now in our 12th year. And we do use the same methods as we're using the CDC project to understand how consumers engage with digital media or digital sensors in the physical environment. Okay, so I've got used to explaining to people what SEEDS um, is uh, over the last couple of years, and so I, I tried to put it on one slide so you can get the idea of the project in a nutshell right at the start. And the fundamental uh, innovation in SEEDS is that it, it's addressing the problem of big data, but through monitoring and measuring subconscious processes that are ongoing in the brain. So the reality of human uh, performance is that for a, a large proportion of what your brain is doing at any point in time, you're not aware of. Okay? So you'll often have heard uh, your name called out at a party or, or discovered that someone's talking about you at a party, a cocktail party phenomenon. And that's because your brain and your sensory system together are monitoring what's going on in your environment and suddenly it's something that's relevant enough for you to focus on consciously that's in your uh, center of your consciousness. But that processing of the ambient environment and the stimuli in the environment um, happens the whole time. And so this processing that at the moment in all our brains we're kind of unaware of and thrown away, no one's, no one's making use of it. So the challenge that we're trying to do in seeds is say, well, what can we identify that's useful in people's subconscious processing um, and how can we apply that to mapping the data space. So what we've been doing in is focusing on what implicit measures of user state we can take, whether that's arousal or attention, how surprised someone is, how uh, satisfied or, or indeed how difficult they're finding something to understand at any point in time. And then we can try and link that to where we can infer people are looking or focusing on in the environment. So whether it's in the seeds experience induction machine, which you'll see um, shortly, or in a physical environment, with sensors built in, you can understand where people are looking and how, uh, what their state is, what they want to do, how they're feeling, and so on. Okay, the seeds approach is then to use this map of the space, so an interest space, a surprise map of the space, um, to then have what we call the sentient agent, it's basically a narrative engine, to guide the user through the environment, and the environment can be a physical environment or a data environment as you'll see, um, to direct people to somewhere that's interesting or surprising or so on. And one of the most uh, challenging aspects of what we're, we're doing is looking at how we can guide people's behaviour subconsciously. So if we know that we want to guide people to somewhere that we've identified as interesting in the data or in the environment, then we need to know how can we point them in that direction um, without saying, looking at them, breaking their natural process of, of exploration. Okay. So from what you've heard already, you'll guess that the project is hugely interdisciplinary. So there's psychologists, computer scientists, <coughs> engineers, uh, sensor teams, um, computer, narrative teams, and, and more. Um, and the applications of scenes, I think we'll see by the end of the day, are huge in lots of different areas. So just to show you who the partners are, and see it's coordinated out of Goldsmiths, um, working very closely with the other substantial partner in the project, which is University of Pompeii Fabra, which is represented here by our scientific director, Paul, put your hand up, Paul, and you'll meet him uh, better later. We've also got Electrolux um, in the consortium, who are white goods manufacturing, and we've got a virtual um, retail showroom 
uh, with electrolytes where they can where people can explore uh, a current ranges of fridges and freezers and, and so on, but we can measure people's implicit reactions to those products. So it's an almost a tool to pretest um, what could be successful designs. Other partners uh, from around Europe, we've got Teesside uh, from the north, we've got uh, Sussex from the south, we've got Goldsmiths obviously in London, we've got a couple in Barcelona, we've got Technica Catalonia and uh, uh, EPF, and we've got Udeo Stories, I think it's Ruth and Hungary, and the Star South as Italy. And central to the seeds problem is the data values, and uh, we try and put it simply is that there's more data out there than we know how to analyze, even with best in class tools um, and current uh, best practice in a whole range of different spheres. So uh, we don't understand how currently we can analyze all the data that exists and data is growing the whole time. And SEEDS basically is using psychology and consciousness theory, so understanding how people process information, both consciously and subconsciously, merging physical and, and virtual environments, and put people in a physical uh, cave type environment that's called the experience induction machine, and we ask people to interact with it in novel ways, and that interaction has a lot of implicit dimensions, so some examples are tracing people's uh, movement, physical movement around uh, the experience induction machine and using that movement as an interaction device both implicitly so that people aren't aware of um, and explicitly so we can enable people to gesture and move around the space to navigate with the data. Central to see is the experience induction machine which we'll see a video of shortly but you can see um, a picture of on the bottom left of the slide there that uh, exists at the moment in Barcelona. Um, we've got within seeds, one of the tasks has been to develop a portable seed experience induction machine. We're going to have one at Goldsmiths uh, very shortly in IT Media's lab. Um, but they can be effectively built relatively cost effectively anywhere. And it's uh, multiple projectors in 3D with an active floor and lots and lots of sensors around the space measuring uh, where you're looking, um, how long you're looking there, your physiological responses, your brain responses. Um, and your physical movement around the space. So together, all of those sensors give us a really good feel for how you're feeling and what you want to do in any space at any time. Um, the idea behind SEEDS is really to uh, monitor signals of surprise and discovery. So I've mentioned already some of the measures that we use. But so when people are experiencing these large data sets, um, we measure people's responses. But it, explicit responses and implicit responses, map those responses to the data set, um, and then use those to, in real time, guide people's attention, uh, conscious or subconsciously, uh, to different areas of interest or potential interest in visualization. So the goal of the is to open up people's minds to meaning and uh, discovery in data sets so they're not actually aware and wouldn't be aware of without the system uh, understanding that. Okay. Now, one of the uh, challenges we looked at in Seeds Point uh, substantially is that if we try and get a map of people's interest or arousal or surprise around a room and a space, then, and, we, and a lot of it is done by our inference, then we're going to get it wrong some of the time. And so you're going to get areas where effectively they're marked as interesting, but it's just an artifact, it's noise. You know, you've got a phone call at the same time as you're looking over there. And, that cause a measure of arousal. So by putting lots of users together, we average out the noise effectively. So individual noise measures disappear um, because we, we average over people. So we can identify what's really interesting. Here are some of the sensors that we, we are using in the scene. So lots of standard physiological ones of heart rate, skin conductance, eye gaze, observable behavior, speech characteristics, so identifying people's arousal or stress. Um, from the uh, non-verbal aspects of their speech um, and brain activity. And I'm going to leave it there for now because Paul's going to blind you some science uh, in just a few minutes. One of the key uh, elements in SEED is that the technologies are a wearable. And Paul, again, is going to show you our wearable uh, head and gaze tracker that you can wear in the XIM that tells you where people are looking. And through analysis in real time of that data, we can say, 
we can map people's interests around the space. We also got from a company called Smartex, who are in the consortium through the University of Pisa, um, wearable uh, vests and suits to measure um, your physiological responses, so it's done in a relatively intrusive way. Um, and also we have active gloves, which we'll see uh, shortly, so you actually get feedback and you can feel the data as you're exploring it, and you'll, you'll get to see that in just a second. So the CET use cases are basically uh, two. One is to communicate no, me no meaning of the data set, so in educational context or for training purposes. The other is to support discovery for experts in, in new data sets. And I know one of Paul's big motivations as, as a neuroscientist in the project is to enable and hope and discover root seeds, something new about the function of the human brain and the neuroscience of the brain. So there's a, there's a real uh, desire for end users to use this tool as something more than just a teaching tool, but as a real scientific discovery tool. And I mentioned already that we've uh, got four different applications uh, or different data sets that we've been focusing on explicitly uh, within the CETA project. One is neuroscience. Um, you'll see a short video from me and hear a bit more about it from Paul. Um, another is archaeology, um, and that's where we're using seeds in quite challenging external environments to help novices and trainees and experts to classify shirts, pottery shirts, in the field while, while they're out doing their digging and uh, collection of artifacts. Um, it's been used uh, in helping the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp create a uh, meaningful representation of the huge data set of uh, articles, artifacts that they have, and we'll show you a video of that later. I mentioned the <coughs> um, electronics uh, virtual show. <coughs> So for neuroscience, basically the idea is that we can load a very large data set of hundreds of, hundreds of neurons with millions of connections between them um, of a, a model human brain. And we can then ask scientists to interact with that data in real time um, and <coughs> understand better the functional and structural characteristics of the brain. Um, and the idea here is that we should be able to teach people better and we should even enable experts to see data differently um, because we're, we're guiding them to where their subconscious is responding to. One image I just wanted to show is one that we developed on the back of seeds, and it's uh, what we call uh, responsive world. And the idea is very similar to uh, the core concept that I've discussed already. So you have, and this is applicable in many, many different domains. And we, the thing I'm talking about here is connected retail, just to try and bring it to life for you. So effectively, the concept that we uh, developed after it is called emotionally intelligent environments. So environments that respond with an appreciation or a feeling or an inference or a guess as to what you want in any point in time or will respond to positively in any point in time. And in a retail context, you can imagine a customer uh, walking into a shop. Um, they're, 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 set, they're responsive being sensed in real time. So their movement around the store, their facial expression, their posture, their behavior, their dwell time around different areas of the store. And then you can make an inference as to uh, whether, whether someone's interested or not. In a product example, I normally you hear is imagine being in a diesel store, walking around, and uh, the, the system identifying that actually you really quite like a pair of jeans based on your behavior um, and your implicit behavior, so your dwell time around the space, the fact that you keep returning to it, you keep looking for it. If that adds to your profile, it will know what you bought previously, what it may gain within your home wardrobe, and if it knows what your personality is, it may also know that you respond well to flattery or to uh, cost saving. So if it may, if the system is capable of knowing all these things about you from your profile, then in real time, it can make emotionally intelligent offer to you in the shop, so you say, Johnny, you obviously like these jeans, um, and you'll look great in them. And so it'll say, it'll, it'll send me, send a, a shop assistant to me with that as a tip. Equally, they may say to Paul, you look great in these jeans, and we'll give you a 20% discount. And that may be Paul's preference to respond. So you can imagine different responses to different offers being sent to different people, um, depending on the inferred state of the user. Now. That's applying the, the same responsive environment concept to retail. Um, we've also looked and 
explore in relation to exploration for oil fields, which I mentioned um, just before uh, the session started. Um, and it can be used to manage any, or to improve access and understanding of any large complex data set. So one of the ones that we'd love to see in the uh, experience induction machine will be some air traffic control uh, scenarios where you physically can uh, control the environment and sense the environment using your natural sensory abilities. Just to very quickly uh, wrap up, I just wanted to mention to you what we see as the core features of what is seeds. So, uh, effectively, there are five of them. The first is obviously you have to have a representation of some data. It can be a it can be a complex uh, multi dimensional data set like the brain and the data that we saw. Um, next is you collect people's responses, both explicitly, so you ask people what way we enable them to navigate consciously, but also measure their implicit responses, and you store that in relation to the data, so there's a relational database between the data and the user response. You can then uh, interpret those reactions and map that that's an interesting space or a less exciting part of the data set. And then, according to uh, goals that you set for the system, you can then navigate people through the data sets or through the environment so that you can target specific user states, whether they're um, of surprise, which is often associated with uh, discovery or, um, or relevance or appreciation or satisfaction, which may be more relevant in other scenarios. And then core feature five is being able to sort of step back and take, take a look at the analytics of it and say, okay, what, what's driving this whole thing? How can we overlay uh, all the responses that we capture in relation to this environmental data set um, in relation to the data? And, and then be able to have, take a more analytic approach and uh, I think it's <coughs> referred to as a more old-fashioned approach in the in the video that we saw earlier. One other element I to just highlight very quickly some work that's going on by one of our partners in SEEDS in the University of Padua, which is the gestural responses. And here we've uh, looked at develop the development of in SEEDS of a natural gesture lexicon for interacting with immersive data. So uh, you can't obviously interact completely, freely and naturally um, with the system today, um, but you almost can. And so what they did in Padua uh, was have a look at get lots of people into the lab, um, get them to imagine and create their own gestures that they identify as natural for opening a fridge door, closing an oven door, uh, for example, or grabbing some brain data, or putting volume up and volume down, or wanting to hear things more clearly, or wanting to focus in on specific areas. So it's user-generated uh, methodology, or it's a million commonalities identified to find a gesture lexicon or alphabet for um, interacting in real time with massive data. Okay, I'm keeping an eye on the time, so I'm going to uh, probably uh, start with just a minute. Just to say one of the key areas that, and you don't have to see this slide, so I'm going to describe the sentiment of it. One of the key areas that we're involved in seeing score at Goldsmiths is to understand the value proposition of seeds and how we can roll seeds out more generally whether it can be solve specific components or as integrated solutions. And we're very keen to talk to uh, anyone in the room and get everyone's view in the room as to what's most interesting or least interesting about what you hear, um, either from me, which is her, what you hear from Paul next, or from any of our speakers um, this afternoon. Finally, uh, flash panel cards are in your, um, in your pack. Anything that you hear from any of the speakers or that just comes into your mind or come with questions already. Um, we'd be delighted if you could write those down um, as ideas and comments on those flash panel cards and post them in the box at the back that's labeled flash panel cards. Um, and we'll, during the afternoon talks, generate some themes around which the, the panels will, um, will discuss this afternoon. Again, if you'd like to join one of the panels, if you can just have a word with me or Andrea um, at some point. Andrea, can you just put your hand up? Um, at some point during lunch or Saturday uh, to, to volunteer to come and give your view, whether from a personal perspective or your or company perspective, you're very interesting. Okay, so I'll leave it there. Just very uh, thank you for listening. I can probably take one or two um, <coughs> questions, but given that Paul's on before lunch and it's going to be hard to keep Paul to less than 30 minutes, um, I suggest you save your questions for the panel. But any burning questions? Uh, please go ahead. Otherwise, thank you.